The text this morning is from 1 Corinthians 14, verses 21 and 22. These are the words of God. In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Heavenly Father, we don't want your word to be something we stumble over. We don't want to make the mistake of thinking that these gospel lessons are somehow beneath us. Prevent us from falling backward. Guard us against being injured, snared, or captured. Bestow your word upon us for blessing, we pray. We ask for this in the name of Jesus, and amen. This Lord's Day, as you've noted, is Pentecost Sunday, and so I thought I would mark the occasion by talking about that word. What do we mean by Pentecost? There are three main uses for the word Pentecost. One, it was a festival of Israel in the Old Testament, one of the assigned festivals that is given to the Jews, in, uh, and they're all delineated in Leviticus chapter 23. So it was one of the festivals of the Jews. Then the Holy Spirit is poured out on the day of Pentecost, and so it became one of the great festivals of the Christian church, marking and commemorating the gift of the Holy Spirit, you might say the birthday of the Christian church constituted as such. Now, of course, God has always had a people. God had his church. God had his congregation. God had his elect throughout the entire Old Testament. But the final constitution of the Christian church was established on this day, in the giving of the Holy Spirit. And so we mark the day of Pentecost that way. Now, a third common use has to do with one of the larger denominations of Christians in the world. Pentecostals are those who have certain distinctives of worship, a certain view of the spiritual gifts, and so forth. So, so if someone says that he is a Pentecostal, he is identifying himself as one of the main branches of Christendom. So you have Pentecostal and non-Pentecostal. So I thought I'd talk about this and say, we're, if we want to commemorate the giving of the Holy Spirit to the church, we want to understand this rightly, and we don't want to misunderstand it. We don't want to misapply it. So the Jewish festival of Pentecost is famously connected to the sign gifts that were poured out on this day. Not only was the Holy Spirit given on this day in Acts chapter 2, but certain particular gifts that accompanied his presence were also given, the gift of tongues and prophecy and the like. So we want to guard against misunderstanding. We want to establish a right understanding. Well, let's consider what it says in 1 Corinthians 14. The outpouring of the gifts of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost was a historical mile marker. It was, in, it, it was located in a particular time in history, and, that, and what happened in that generation was significant and connected to the gifts. It's specifically designated, Paul says here, as a sign to unbelieving Jews. He says this is a sign for the unbeliever. And we can tell from how he's applying it that it's a sign not just for unbelievers generically, but a sign for unbelieving Jews. He's quoting Isaiah chapter 28, verses 11 and 12, and we can see from this that he's referring to unbelieving Jews. So when he says, in the law it is written, with men of other tongues and with other lips will I speak unto this people. Who are these people? Uh, Isaiah is talking about the Jews. I will speak through foreign languages to this people. Despite this clear indication and sign, the unbelieving Jews will continue on in their unbelief. Now, this is exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. This is precisely what happened on that day. In the streets of Jerusalem, within a generation... All right, within a generation, we have a sign in the day of Pentecost that within one generation, <coughs> the streets of Jerusalem are going to be filled up with foreign language speakers in a negative sense. Think of it like hearing a lot of German in Paris. Right. That, that's what's going on here. Think of it as hearing a lot of English being spoken on the streets of Baghdad. What does that mean? Well, it's not a good sign for the previous regime 
whoever was running the show, when you have an, a flood of foreign language speakers coming into your city, coming into your streets, that's not a good sign. It's a sign of destruction. It's a sign of historical judgment. It is a sign of conquest and defeat. It is not a sign of happy prayer times coming. Right? It's not uh, the, the streets of Jerusalem did not fill up with foreign languages so that the Jewish leaders would say, oh, we are now going to be given the gift of ecstatic utterance. No, it was a sign of judgment. The gift of tongues was given as a sign of historical judgment falling upon Israel in a terrible way. And Jesus identified this destruction of Jerusalem as one of the worst things that happened in the history of the human race, which, as it turned out, it was. In contrast, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, prophecies intended to edify and build up those within the church. So, so here, here's the, the problem. If tongues were given as a sign against this people, meaning the unbelieving Jews, then Paul says it doesn't really make sense for Christians, all the people who believe, to gather together in a meeting and have that meeting characterized by tongue speaking. He said he put a limit on it, two or the, you know, don't um, don't let it get away from you. He puts a limit on the prophecy, and he doesn't want any tongue speaking without interpretation. Because if it's just gibberish, if it's just yammering, it's it's um, it's gibberish to you. It's you might say Greek to you, and it's a sign. I don't know what's going on. I'm not inside. I don't know what's happening here. I'm not in the loop. Somebody needs to inform me. This could be really bad. All right, that's, the, that's the sensation you ought to get. And Paul doesn't want that sensation generated within the church. So he, um, he requires, he puts a limit on prophecy, two or at the most three, and he requires that all um, tongue speaking be interpreted into the language that everybody understood if it's happening in a believing assembly. If it's happening in the streets of Jerusalem, it doesn't have to be interpreted. It not being interpreted is the point. Right? Not being interpreted out in the streets is the point. So, in addition to this, uh, the other text I have on your outline is 2 Corinthians 12, 12, which says, Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Now here, Paul says that signs, wonders, and mighty deeds are characteristic of an apostle. Right? An, an apostle, that, that's a distinguishing mark of an apostle. So these gifts, these sign gifts, were connected, and we see in the, in the pages of Scripture, they're connected either to apostles or to men who were in the apostolic band. They were either apostles or people who were clustered around the apostles. It's, it's a distinction of an apostolic company, a distinction of an apostle. So this means that if someone has the distinguishing mark of an apostle, what does an apostle get to do? What does an apostle get to do? Well, among other things, an apostle can speak for God. An apostle can speak words of Scripture. Paul is an apostle. He writes the New Testament for us. Peter is an apostle. He writes the first and second Peter. An apostle has the authority to speak for Christ. Apostello is a verb meaning send. And an apostolic authority is on the same level with the sending body. So Christ is, in the book of Hebrews, Christ is called an apostle. He's an apostle of God. As an apostle of God, Christ represents God. Christ speaks for God. The 12 were apostles of Christ. He commissions them and he sends them. And as apostles, they have the authority to speak in the name of Jesus. They have the authority to speak for Christ. We have apostles today, but with lowercase a, uh, because the lowercase has to do with the sending body. When you send out a church planter, when you send out a missionary, you're sending out an apostle. But the apostle only has the authority of the sending body. So if a church plant, sends out a church planter to plant a church, he has authority, he's commissioned, and he, uh, he ought to live up to the authority that sent him. But if he's sent out by the church, he doesn't speak for Christ. If he's sent out... Um, by a mission agency, he doesn't speak for God. His words are not inspired utterances. So Paul says, if, if someone can, can walk on water, if someone can raise the dead, if someone can, uh, can do these sorts of things, you had better pay attention to what he's saying. 
because these are distinguishing marks of an apostle. Now, there are a couple of other things that we have to put together. In Deuteronomy 13 and Deuteronomy 18, we have the distinguishing marks of a prophet, a true prophet. A true prophet will not prophesy false gods, will not prophesy, hey, let's go after this other god. And a true prophet, whatever he says, will come to pass. If he prophesies, it will come to pass. If it doesn't come to pass, don't pay attention to him. And if he says something and it comes to pass, but he's preaching another god, he's preaching that you ought to worship Baal, you don't listen to him. So a false prophet is characterized by what he says coming to pass, and he represents the true God. He's orthodox, and he's, uh, his prophecies come to pass. It's the same sort of thing with an apostle. If someone does a, a sign or a wonder or a miracle, but they're preaching a false god, you dismiss them. But if they're preaching the true God, and they do a, a bona fide miracle, not just uh, the, the kind of miracle that you can fake, you know, having one arm grow, that sort of thing, if... If you don't, uh, if it's a if it's a genu genuine miracle, you you see it, and he's preaching the the, the uh, God God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, and he does a miracle. Um, the the things that mark an apostle are signs, wonders, and various miracles. So, what does this mean? Flip over to Isaiah twenty-eight, if you would.
away. We can't say, this is what God from heaven sent his Holy Spirit to tell us and then wad it up and throw it away. To wad it up and throw it away is, uh, is tantamount to rejecting the claim I'm making. So if prophecy proper, if prophecy proper is an extant gift operating in the church today, then it follows that the canon of Scripture is not closed. If the canon of Scripture is closed, then it follows that prophecy proper is not an extant gift. The gift that was given to Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Agabus in the New Testament, that gift of prophecy is not extant. In the book of Ephesians, Paul says that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. And in Ephesians, Paul says that the church is built on the foundation of the, pro the apostles and prophets. Apostolic gifts and pro prophetic gifts are foundation gifts. When you're building a three-story house, you don't pour concrete in the attic. You, you don't pour a slab in the attic. Are you, that's not what you do on the third story. You do that on the ground floor. You do that in the first century. You do that when the church is first established. And where you pour the slab is where you build the house. All right, so th when you build the church on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, what you're doing is you're building the walls in such a way that are true to the foundation. We don't have the authority. One of the reasons why reformations are necessary in the history of the church is occasionally somebody says, I'd like to, I'd like to build a wing out there into the yard, and they just build the wing out into the yard, and there's no foundation underneath it. And someone comes along a generation later and says, why are we praying to Mary? You know, what, what are we praying to Mary for? And they tear the wing off. They, they, they take that down. We can't build on that which is not foundational. The apostolic gifts are foundational. The prophetic gifts are foundational. Now, I use the phrase prophecy proper because every preacher of the word is called to prophesy in a certain sense, a lesser sense. Um, in 1 Peter 4.11, it says, the one who speaks must speak as the very oracles of God. On account of this, the Puritans even called preaching prophesying. This, but this is a lowercase p. They did not confuse it with, they did not muddle it up with the, the insp inspired prophecy that the prophets in the Bible had. It was sharply distinguished from what they did. So you should, if you're following this reformed understanding of gospel declaration, prophetic declaration, you should come to listen to a sermon prepared to encounter the Word of God as it's declared to you, but without equating the sermon outline or the words spoken with Scripture. All right, so you, God's people should come to a sermon expecting to be fed by God, expecting to be fed by the Holy Spirit, and expecting to be fed by the Word of God. And this is why it's so important for a preacher to always have the Scriptures right there and to be declaring what he declares straight out of the Scripture. In short, what, uh, this is uh, what neo-Orthodox theologians claim about the Bible. Uh, if you talk to a neo-Orthodox theologian, you say, well, this is, not, this is not the Word of God, but you should read it expecting to run into the Word of God from time to time. You, you, should, ex you should expect to encounter the Word of God here. Um, that we reject that. This, these, as I, when I come to read the text, I'll say, these are the words of God, and I'll read you the words of God. This is, this, the Bible is God's revelation to us. But when we preach, when we declare, when we're expounding, what we're doing is... Um, giving an uninspired declaration of God's inspired word in which uninspired and fallible declaration, the spirit moves, right? And, and you should expect the spirit to move there and apply the word of God to your life and to your heart. And this particular, the ability of the Holy Spirit to move in this way is not dependent upon a particular preacher's gifts or graces. So, we have to distinguish also between the sign gift of power that's resident within someone and answers to prayer. Now, uh, oftentimes people say, well, you, are you saying that you don't believe the gift of healing is going on today? No, I don't believe the gift of healing is going on today. But that's not the same thing as saying, I don't believe that healing goes on today. There's a difference. The gift of healing, the gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues is where God causes the gift to reside in a particular person. The fact is that sign gifts are, uh, authenticate the ministry of an apostle, and to, to claim that, that that has ceased does not mean that the Holy Spirit has ceased, and does not mean that the Holy Spirit has gone out of the world. The choice is not between a lively Pentecostalism on the one hand, and a duddy non-Pentecostalism 
on the other. We don't believe, it's, it's not like the Pentecostals believe the Holy Spirit's alive and the rest of us believe the Holy Spirit is dead. Um, that's not, and, and so since that's not the case, we should not act as though we believe the Holy Spirit is dead. Too often cessationists, cessationists are those who believe that the sign gifts authenticating an apostle um, believe that that was foundational and established in the first century. Too often, cessationists act like God died, and they are, in they are in charge of maintaining the mausoleums, and they build impressive cathedral-like mausoleums, and they hold quiet and decorous services because we're all sad that God died. But we're not weeping for Tammuz. We're not memorializing or commemorizing um, the, the death of God, we are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. And the Jesus who rose from the dead ascended into heaven and he gave his Holy Spirit and he poured out his Holy Spirit into the world so that stuff would happen. So, a man with the gift of healing, as, a, as distinct from a man who prays for healing, a man with the gift of healing could walk through a hospital ward and heal the people there, walking from one bed to another, touching the people, and power would flow from him to the people in the beds, and he could raise them all up, walk down one side, and then walk up the, uh, walk up the other side. That's what a man with the gift of healing could do. And incidentally, if there were a man alive who could do that, we would all know his name. Right? If there were a man who could do that, we would know his name. He would be on the cover of time. We'd be talking about a man who had power resident within him to heal people that way. Jesus did it 2,000 years ago, and that's one of the reasons we all know his name. He came into the nation of Israel authenticating his ministry. He established who he was. He established his authority to speak for God. When the woman with the hemorrhage touched him, the Lord felt healing power go out of him. Right? It, was, it was like a, a charged battery. Right? A man with the gift of healing is, was charged, and he had the ability to heal. And when that power went out, he knew it. He knew the power had departed out from him. This is different than interceding for the sick or when the elders gather to pray for someone who is sick and God answers the prayer. It's, it's a routing question. A man with the gift of healing puts his hand on someone and power flows from him to the person healed. It's just straight across. God has entrusted that power to the man with the gift of healing and he touches someone and the power goes from him to the person being healed. When you pray for healing, as you ought to do, when you pray believing for healing, as you ought to do, the routing goes this way. It goes from you to God and from God to the person. And we should expect to, when we should expect to have our prayers answered. So we're not routing it differently because we think, well, we're, we have to route it this way because God always says no. That's not the case. We should expect to see God answer a prayer. We should expect the Holy Spirit to be active in the world. So... To deny that the first thing is still happening today, to deny that someone has the power of healing vested in him, is not to say that the second sort of thing happens rarely, if at all. Those are two separate questions. Disbelief in false apostles, disbelief in false healers, should never translate over into unbelief in God. God's promises to answer prayer, God's summons for us to pray for healing, for pray for one another, pray for one another in our trials and tribulations, which would include physical ailments. Those promises, God did not expect us to wrap it all up in a box and forget about it and leave it, leave it back in the first century. The, the uh, tendency of certain staid and respectable Christians to wrap up all the promises of God and leave them back in the first century is one of the reasons why he, uh, we have the rise of movements like Pentecostalism. Because, uh, and I don't mean by saying this, that Pentecostalism is all bad. I believe that their uh, human nature will be avenged. And if you suppress something, that God tells us to do something, if God directs us to do it, and if we quit doing it, and we quit doing it for a time, then there will be, at some point, an overreaction. There will be some point, uh, uh, someone will kick against that and perhaps go to an excess over there. But we ought to be more worried about our excesses than theirs. So, last thing uh, before we come to the application. We, the fact that we believe that the sign gifts have ceased does not, does not mean that we believe the universe functions in the way that the materialists believe that it does. The materialists believe that all the, 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 the universe is just time and chance acting on matter. It's just atoms banging away. 
Just imagine that the whole universe is full of these atoms, like a gigantic billiard ball table, and, and some force, some energy, caused all the, the, uh, the balls on the table to scatter, and they're just banging around. And that's, that's the universe. It's just, that, that's the way it is. It's just dead matter banging around. Too often, Christians say, no, no. They contradict this at sort of the, uh, the last possible point. They say, no, no, no. Uh, we have souls. We, we're created in the image of God. But they grant the universe to the atheists. They grant the universe to the materialists. And they're, they're sort of taking a last stand trying to defend the fact that, that although we live in a materialistic universe, we ourselves are personal. We bear the image of God. We have souls. Now, it's true that we have souls. And it's true that we bear the image of God and so on. But we live and move and have our being in God himself. Spiritual realities surround us on every hand. The world is not a machine grinding away in accordance with natural laws. The universe is personally governed and is itself teeming with life. The universe is personally governed. In Jesus Christ, all things hold together. And the universe is teeming with life. The universe is not what the materialist claims. It's not as though you talk to an atheist and we agree about the world out there, but we disagree about whether there's this tiny, teeny, tiny spark of divinity within us, but we agree about the world. No, if you believe the Bible, if you believe God, if you believe that, that we are body, soul, and spirit together, then your view of the world is utterly at odds with that uh, held by the materialist. So, the gift of prophecy, or tongues plus interpretation, is not a gift of spiritual utterance. It is a gift of guaranteed spiritual utterance. In other words, the fact that something is spiritual doesn't make it true. The fact that something is spiritual doesn't make it true. The Bible is not our ultimate infallible authority because it consists of spiritual words. It is our final and infallible authority because it represents the perfections of God himself. It's it's infallible and ultimate because it's the word of God, not because it's the word of a spirit. The devil is a spirit. The devil's a spirit, and the devil speaks lying words. Not only does the devil speak lying words, but the Bible says that he is the father of lies. The father of all lies is the the headwaters of lies, is a spiritual source. The devil is a spirit, and he can speak. We have spirits, and we can speak. Our words are not just the motion of atoms in the air or the function of ink on a page. We speak spiritual words. Spiritual things are accomplished when words are spoken. And they're accomplished for good or ill, depending on whether the words are true or false. Depending on whether the spiritual words are true or false. Depending on whether they line up with the Bible. So then, we do not surrender the nature of the world by guarding the true nature and boundaries of the Bible. The fact that we say that the Bible is the unique word of God does not mean that outside the Bible we have this big impersonal machine. Because we don't have a big impersonal machine out there in the world, we, are, we should be able to read the Bible and trust in the God who gave us this word and who gave us the world, and we look at the story here so that we can go out and understand the story there. So, how do we apply this? We are not Pentecostals. Our tradition, our communion, our denomination is not Pentecostal in the denominational sense. All right? So much is obvious. We are not Pentecostal in the denominational sense. But we ought to be spirit-saturated and spirit-directed people. Too many people say, well, you know, evangelicals have Jesus and mainliners have the Father and the Holy, uh, Charismatics and the Pentecostals have the Holy Spirit as though we've divvied up God, the triune God. No, all Christians have all of God. God is everywhere. God is omnipresent. God is the triune God. Is Think of the omnipresence of God this way. God is not omnipresent in the sense of being spread thin over all the cosmos. God is omnipresence in the sense of his center is everywhere and his circumference nowhere. God is a circle that has no circle. His center is everywhere and his circumference nowhere. God, it's not just that God is here in this room. It's that all of God is here in this room. All of him. All right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so if we want to walk as Christians who believe in the triune God, we have to walk in the Spirit. As the Apostle Paul tells us, 
a number of times. He tells us this in Romans 8.1. He says it again in Romans 8.4. He says it in Galatians 5.16. He says it again in Galatians 5.25. Walk with the Spirit. What does that mean? Walk with the Spirit. What does that mean? Well, there are three things I'd like to press on you to ask you to consider as you go out, as the benediction sends you with God's blessing to, to walk with the Spirit. The first, the first thing is look at each day, every day that you live, from the time you get up to the time you go to, to bed. Look at each day as a microcosm and as a type of your whole life. Each day is a microcosm and a type of your whole life. The Bible tells us that the Spirit, one of the central things the Spirit is doing in the world, is enabling us to yearn for the day of resurrection. Between, uh, here's another way of thinking of the resurrection. Resurrection day, what is resurrection day? What is the great, the last day? In spiritual terms, resurrection morning is tomorrow morning. You live your life, you go to sleep, to use the biblical terminology, you, you live your life, you go to bed, and you wake up. That's the typology. And every day you live is a little, each day you live is a type of your whole life. And the Holy Spirit is enabling you to work. And I, if, the, if the Spirit really is at work in you and through you, the Holy Spirit is enabling you to work hard. And if you work hard, you'll come to the end of the day tired. Sometimes, if you're greatly blessed, you'll come to the end of the day so tired that you're cross-eyed. Right? You're, just re- you're just ready for bed. But there's a difference between approaching bed with delight and waking up having rested. There is a difference between yearning for rest and being rested. Right? When, you know what it's like when you've had a glorious sleep. Let's say you're so tired, you're cross-eyed, you go to sleep. There's no, you know, no phone calls at 5.30 from a cousin who doesn't know about time zones. There's, you, know, you, you get to sleep in, you wake up, and it's gorgeous weather. Everything's right, and you've got everything you needed, and you feel rested all the way down to your bones. You are rested. That is what resurrection morning is going to be like, only to the nth degree. Right? Now that, and that's why your, your life now, as you're striving and working and laboring and taking dings and, and your body is getting wore out, and each day is a type of that. And the Holy Spirit is governing this whole process. In Romans 8.26, the Holy Spirit is yearning in us, longing for tomorrow morning. The Holy Spirit is longing for us to work today so that we can go to bed tired and wake up rested. The Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is the same Spirit who's at work in us. So the Spirit enables us to labor and work, go to bed exhausted, and wake up rested. And every day that happens to you, every day that happens to you ought to be, oh, here's, a, here, here's God preaching the gospel. Here's God preaching eschatology to me. Here's God preaching the destiny of the world to me again, yet again today. And you want to walk with the Spirit in such a way that you understand that that's what's happening every day. Every day, you go to bed exhausted, and you wake up refreshed, and you say, this, this is what it's all about. This is what it's like. The second thing is the Holy Spirit, is one of the things the Bible describes the Holy Spirit doing is bringing order out of chaos. The Holy Spirit brings order out of chaos. We see this in the second verse of the Bible. The Holy Spirit hovers over the face of the deep. Before God starts shaping everything into a glorious, ordered, complicated, enormously complex world, the Holy Spirit hovers over the face of the deep. The Holy Spirit, in Colossians 2, it talks about us as God's people being knit together in love. This is the work of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit, as we're knit together in love, the Holy Spirit is the, what is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience. The Holy Spirit is at work in us, enabling us to love one another, and we are being knit together over time in a particular process. All right, walking with the Spirit is a process. So whenever you see chaos, all right, what should you think? Uh, it ought not to be, oh no, we're all going to die. <laughs> but when, when you see chaos, it ought not to be, oh no, we're toast. Oh no, we're done. Oh no, it's all over. Uh, you know, the bad guys are winning. Um, Whenever we, say, whenever we see chaos, we ought to think, you know, it looks like the Holy Spirit has himself another project. You ought to think, what, what, what do I think when I see one of my daughters or my wife with a big ba- coming home with a big bag of yarn? What is, what is chaos? That's Holy Spirit yarn. 
The Holy Spirit has a project. The Holy Spirit is going to knit something together. The Holy Spirit is going to knit you together in love. Do you, you, I hope you understand that if it weren't for the Holy Spirit in the world, a bunch of you would have absolutely nothing to do with one another. You are disparate elements. You wouldn't be here if it were not for the Holy Spirit knitting you together in love. And God sends his spirit into the world, a world of unbelief and disbelief and rebellion and chaos. And the Holy Spirit comes on the face of the deep. And then the result is glorious. This is what the Holy Spirit is up to. Then the third thing, and this is where I want you to uh, concentrate your, your thoughts, your, concentrate your meditation. You've heard many times that you are called as Christians to be shaped by the scripture and to understand the story. Understand the story. Understand the story of scripture. Understand how God tells story in history. Understand the story and understand your own story in the light of all these other stories. But this is not possible without the Holy Spirit walking with you. When you walk with the Spirit, when you walk in the Spirit, what is happening? Many times people think, many times Christians think that walking with the Spirit means standing there, right? Be sweet. It's all right. It's, it's all right if you're clueless as long as you're sweet. You know, just stand there, be sweet and clueless. But the verb is walk. The verb is a process. The, the verb means you have to go from here to this afternoon to this evening to tomorrow. You've got to walk through a process. And you have to make decisions left or right. Say this or be silent. Say this or say that. I have to make a decision whether to take this job or, or, or go somewhere else. How do I walk with the Spirit in this? I can't walk with the Spirit unless I'm walking with the Spirit, understanding the narrative line. I have to understand the narrative line. What is, how does he work? What, what is he like? What, what sort of plot devices does the Holy Spirit love? Well, we've seen one of the things he loves is order out of chaos. That's one of the things he loves. He loves life from the dead. That's another thing he loves. He loves exile and return. That's another thing he loves. He loves dishonor and honor. He loves dishonor followed by vindication. That's another thing that he loves. What does the Holy Spirit do? How does the Holy Spirit tell, tell stories? What story is the Holy Spirit doing, telling? What, he's, what is he saying here in Moscow, Idaho? And you figure that out and you walk with him. You walk with him, and you walk with him by cultivating love, joy, peace, patience, asking him to bestow these things on you. But it's not enough to be a bucket on the floor asking to be filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. You're not a bucket on the floor. You're a character in the story. And you need to walk, and you say, what, in this instance, what does love do? In this instance, what does patience do? In this instance, what does self-control do as you're walking with him through the story? This is the Spirit's work. So you're Christians. You're not Pentecostal Christians in the denominational sense, but you ought to be spirit-saturated Christians. You ought to be spirit-directed people. You need to be people who walk with the Spirit, who walk in the Spirit, who understand what God's calling you to. And you stand up and say, you know, God's under calling me to understand part of this, and God never, under God never expected any creature to understand all of it. That's one of the things you understand. You're not supposed to understand all of it. You're supposed to understand your part in it. You're supposed to understand what you're to do next. So when we do this, we're not trying to... Uh, what we want to do is make sure that we don't get all our T's crossed and all our I's dotted and all our confessions in order and, every, and our necktie straight and we do everything straight and the liturgy straight and then we line up in rows and then we just stand there and wait for the Lord to come. Uh, the Spirit likes messier stories than that. The, the Spirit likes to work with more chaos than that. Let the Spirit bring order out of chaos. Don't you impose your own order on the chaos and act like he did it. Um, be more flexible, be more open, be more exuberant, be more loose in the joints as you walk with the Spirit of God. Our Father and our God, Father of wisdom, you are the God of all wisdom. Help us to know how to apply our Bibles to our lives. Help us to see what you've placed in this portion of your word. Help us to make true and obedient application throughout the course of our entire lives. In, in this, we offer up the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The Holy Spirit of God works with nothing. He created the universe. God created the universe out of nothing, ex nihilo. 
It says in Corinthians, just as God created light out of darkness, so he created light in our hearts. The Holy Spirit works with nothing. The Holy Spirit works with chaos. The Holy Spirit works with uh, those of little reputation. The Holy Spirit did a marvelous thing with Nazareth, which was a little nothing town. The Holy Spirit brought a great prophet, John the Baptist, out of wilderness, which is just rocks and scrub brush. The Holy Spirit is not bound the way we think circumstances are bound. The Holy Spirit can work with anyone, anywhere, and that includes you. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work, and amen.